let's just say awakening is implied and employed uh, with some passages. So for example, in Acts chapter one, they prayed for 10 days together. And the result was what we would probably define as some would say revival, because it, but I would argue that's more of an awakening where in the day of Pentecost, 3,000 was saved in one day. So it affected all Jerusalem. So you can't argue that that was an example of awakening, even though the term awakening wasn't used. You could also argue that when the man was healed in Acts chapter 3, uh, I think he had weak ankles for 38 years, then he leaped and walked and jumped and boom. Next thing you know, Acts chapter 3 and 4 talk about how uh, it made a great stir in all of Jerusalem. And then the Pharisees and Sadducees brought Peter, James, and John uh, and the apostles and said, you're filling all of Jerusalem with this teaching. You know, you're blaming us for this man's blood. So evidently, the first two chapters of Acts, uh, chapter, I'm sorry, after the church was born, chapter two and three, was so powerful what happened that it affected all of Jerusalem. So you could argue that. Um, you could also argue in Acts chapter eight, that when Philip went to Samaria, there was an awakening. It says the whole city was filled with joy. He was casting out demons. People who were paralyzed were healed. Uh, one other notable example, and there are possible implications in other places, would be in Acts chapter 19, where we see out of the um, school of Tyrannus in Ephesus, uh, the word of the Lord went out and the fear of God fell on all the inhabitants. So it didn't say the fear of God fell on the hall of Tyrannus, it fell on the whole city. People were burning books on witchcraft and then it affected the economy where they had a call uh, an ecclesia in the assembly hall to determine what to do with Paul. A secular church meeting or a secular ecclesia was called. In the Greek, the assembly is ecclesia. It means a political gathering, which is the same terminology Jesus used for the church, called them the ecclesia. So you could argue that that was an awakening. Uh, people today would not argue with that. However, Let's back up again. Did these awakenings come because they were focusing on and praying for awakening? See, this is where the rubber hits the road. I am not arguing it wasn't awakenings. Um, and to me, the main example we have in terms of revival, um, I, would, I would propose to you is Acts chapter 9, verse 31, but it was more of a renewal and a refreshing than a revival. After Paul um, was converted, all of the impetus for persecution was stopped. So he got, he led the persecution in Acts chapter eight. Uh, he was part of the death of Stephen. And then he was confronted with Jesus on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter nine, after he was saved, by no coincidence, in verse 31, it says, you know, because the persecution stopped, it says, then the church had a time of peace and refreshing in the Holy Ghost, walking in the fear of the Lord. So you could argue that that was not a revival because they weren't dead, but a refreshing, okay? Um, a impl an implication of God imploring us for revival could be made in um, the book of Revelation, chapters two and three, when Jesus told the church of Ephesus to come back to their first love, to repent from where they had fallen. And then you have the church of Sardis, chapter three, which says you have a, a reputation that you're alive, but you're dead. And obviously that could be a revival because uh, they were cold, they were walking in lukewarmness, and Jesus is commanding them to repent. The other churches, you it's a little more complex, but you could argue some similar things. There's some doctrinal things involved as well. 
So the question arises, um, is praying for revival normative for a healthy church? I would argue no. Second thing is, should the church focus and put all their efforts on awakening? Well, perhaps there's room for that corporately, but I do not believe, and I, can, I, I am not trying to debate, and I am not trying to argue. I'm presenting my thoughts, and we could have different people weigh in and disagree with me, because I'm not trying to win an argument. I'm really trying to learn. I am trying to learn. I, I learned from all your perspectives. In my opinion, they didn't focus on the lost or the awakening, I should say, but we see the recipe for the powerful first century church in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, and it tells us the recipe, the things they were focused on. Not once does it say praying for awakening. It says, and the, uh, the people were devoted to the apostles' doctrine. That was number one, doctrinal teaching. Um, second thing it says, into the breaking of bread that had to do with doing life together and having holy communion, you know, having dinner. To prayer, that's fellowship, uh, I'm sorry, corporate prayer by implication. Of course, individual prayer, but corporate prayer, I think is the context there. And then it says, and fellowship. So you have four things there that they were devoted to. And then we see some similar things in Acts chapter 4. Uh, I think it's verse 34 and on, where it says, All those who were believers were of one heart and one soul. Nobody thought that what they had, their possessions were their own, but they shared. They had all things in common. And then it says, With great power, the apostles uh, you know, performed signs and wonders. So... They didn't focus on signs and wonders, in my opinion. They focused on establishing disciples. That was the apostles' doctrine. We, we noticed that after Acts chapter 1, the original 120 uh, who were praying in the upper room, they were called disciples. But we see a vast uh, void between Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 6. They weren't called disciples anymore. It says that the number of believers were added to the Lord. Acts chapter 2, 3,000 were added to the Lord. Uh, every day, people were getting saved. It tells us in Acts chapter 5, God added to the church. But not once was the word disciple mentioned. Mm -hmm. And I, I talked about this <coughs> in one of our um, tables, but my opinion is that they took these new believers and they they brought them through a period of catechesis or catechizing them, the apostles' doctrine. They had to learn the first principles, as is mentioned in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12 to Hebrews 6, verse 3. But there are definitely first principles of the faith they had to know before they can go on to maturity. Church history tells us that even the early church would not baptize somebody unless they went to a, a period of being a, what's called a catechumen for at least a year or two, uh, many two years, before they were officially welcomed into the church through baptism. That being said, whatever that means um, is not the focus, but I believe the reason why they weren't called disciples until Acts chapter 6, I think it's verse 7, it says the number of disciples multiplied, or could be verse uh, 10 or 12, um, is because they had to go through the apostles' doctrine learn the first principles, and after um, they went through a certain process that satisfied the apostles, that they were rooted and grounded, they were numbered amongst the disciples. Um, and so I propose to you, as is the focus of my book, The Jesus Principles, is that it's a lot easier to get a church all together to fast and pray for awakening and revival constantly than it is to come up with a serious audited learning process of making disciples, getting in people's face, correcting them, holding them accountable, teaching them the first principles, breaking them up. They also went house to house, having small groups, um, 
that process of oneness, which didn't just come because, you know, Holy Ghost came on. Well, I know a lot of tongue talkers that are divisive. It wasn't just because they prayed. You have to have all these ingredients together. There has to be some kind of process of biblical teaching, doctrine. And the reason why, in my opinion, again, just giving you my ideas here, the apostles' doctrine came first is not an accident in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Because if you don't frame your fellowship, your prayers, and your, um, your corporality with the apostles' doctrine, they won't even know why they're having communion. They won't know why they're praying. They won't even know why they're fellowshipping. So that's why they first focused on taking people through a serious process of biblical discipleship. Uh, so they were committed to the apostles' doctrine. Then it said to the breaking of bread, prayers, and the fellowship. If we don't have a process of biblical discipleship through teaching, then everything else is going to be lost. And so in my opinion, what the charismatic movement has collapsed down to is having nice, big, visceral experiences on Sunday with great concert like gospel singing or, or Hillsong singing, whatever it is that you do. I don't know what you do. Um, it's a great visceral experience, emotional experience, even spiritually. You feel the presence of God. People get really blessed, and I think that's great. We do that in our church. And then they have some motivational preaching. And unfortunately, a lot of the preaching doesn't have enough theological density to make disciples So, because you have a mixed crowd. So you have to have something else on top of Sunday preaching. Although I think if we're skillful enough, we could throw in theological tidbits every time we preach to teach everybody so that everyone's getting fed. Um, it takes some skill, but you could do it. But the, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, that's what the job of a catechist is. You have some theologians who are really good when they're talking to other theologians and serious scholars and learners of the word. Um, but the average person would not, you know, you give the average person in your church a book by N.T. Wright, they'll get lost. They couldn't even read the first two pages. N.T. writes to other academicians, serious scholars, pastors. Um, uh, people like myself, my main call is not to other academics. I'm more of a catechetical, if some consider me a scholar, a biblical teacher, whatever. My role is more catechetical, which is that I take theology and I try to make it applicable in the context of laymen or everyday people. Uh, and pastors and leaders who are not yet theologians or academicians, but they know enough to learn and be taken through a process. So my main call and my passion is more catechetical than it is to academia. I just released, uh, I'm releasing a book on the apostolic and it is academic, uh, but I didn't enjoy a lot of that process. It, I had to do it for, um, you know, a doctorate I was working on. But I'd rather write books that are more simple that will bless the body. So that's my role. But getting back to uh, this, I believe that the charismatic church has collapsed down to great worship service, motivational preaching, maybe some prophecies and healing. But we are, free. and then our focus a lot of times is praying for awakening. Uh, and maybe God's leading you to do that. That's fine. But uh, I, I propose that unless we mimic what we see in the early church, we're not going to have early church results. It was a pattern of teaching, sound doctrine, making disciples. Yes, Jesus healed the sick. He cast out de demons. He had large crowds. But his main agenda was always the 12. He was always... Um, he always had in mind the 12 in everything he did. Uh, whether he was raising the dead girl, he brought uh, Peter, James, and John in. He was teaching them faith, teaching them principles. Every time he did something, he had at least three people with him. 
even the Garden of Gethsemane at his three closest because he wanted them to see his prayer life in great duress where he's dripping uh, drops of blood. So everything Jesus did was, in my opinion, um, for the tw to, to raise up the 12 so that when he left, he could have a strong church. And then they replicated that. The early church was a disciple-making movement, just the way Jesus said, Matthew 28, 19, make disciples of all the nations. So um, as I wind this down before our conversation arises, um, it's easier, in my opinion, just to focus on prayer for awakening and just to have a great charismatic meeting on Sunday. But that would be like having... Um, you know, a skeletal frame missing the head and missing the feet and missing the heart. I mean, it's like you got a few things there, but not everything. Um, and the wine skin is lacking. If I had to conclude with one analogy, you know, remember when Jesus said you have to pour new wine into new wine skins, we are focusing on the wine the experience, the presence, the power, the healings, the miracles. And I believe in all that. We're focusing on the wine, but we are not focusing on the wine skin. And if you don't have a good wine skin, you will not be able to hold the wine. Now, not to be uh, bashful about this, but if you want to learn about what you know, dive into this more. I do have an institute for apostolic leadership and um, very reasonable price. And if you didn't have the money, just do it. But it really gets into a lot of this 48 sessions, 12 modules, world-class speakers like Alan Hirsch. And then my book, Essays in Apostolic Leadership, it's all about wineskin kind of stuff. So that, you know, you could go on Amazon or go on my website for that. So for more of this kind of stuff, you could do that. But getting back to what I'm saying is, uh, my question is, does this make sense? Are we focusing more on wine than on the wineskin? And can we focus on both at the same time? I guess would be the question, which I, I want to do, obviously. So anybody want to weigh in on this? And, you know, I know this is very thought provoking and a lot of people I'm sensing are going to want to say something. So let's try to limit our remarks to maybe three minutes each. Hmm. So anybody go ahead. Yeah, Bishop, I'll, I'll, I'll start us off if it's all right. Um, so you, you presented a lot to respond to. So I think I can share first, I agree with your, with your thoughts or how you're thinking or how you're approaching it. I'm, I'm in complete agreement with it. I really like how you defined revival, awakening, and even renewal. I think those definitions are important. I don't think a lot of people use Christian language like that as exact. They'll interchangeably use these words without thinking through what they really mean, but I agree with the definition and the importance. Now, the way I see this is, should we focus on it? And the answer is yes and no. Uh, yes, in that we need to understand the, the will of God. We need to understand the eternal purposes of God. We need to understand that which is fruitful and worthy things to go after. Saved souls should be a goal of a church. It should be a missional component, a core missional component of that, uh, not the only one. <clears throat> so uh, there needs to be, I think, a well thought out um, holistic view of what is the Great Commission, what are we going after, and are we understanding what the eternal purposes of Christ are so that we're pursuing those that are earthbound and those that are after. But once we understand what those goals are, I think the next level is to say, what methodology, what are the things that we need to focus on in order to achieve that? Because if I only focus on an end goal and I lose the process, I actually won't be focused on that end goal. So we can pray for an end goal and do nothing more than that. And I believe that's a recipe of failure. 
And I think that's what a lot of people are doing. Let's have a revival meeting. When I hear that language, it irks me. I'm like, that doesn't work that way quite. I understand what they may be going after, and I'm in agreement with stirring things up. But I, the process is key. So we need to keep the end in mind, as they say, but we need to be more focused on the, the, the right methods or process. But now I'll end with this. There's also another danger that comes up. We get so focused on the process or the steps within the method that now that becomes the end goal <laughs> rather than the process becoming a means to an end. Now we're just focused on we did it. We discipled people. But wait a minute, that, that was a means to an end to something else that Christ is doing. For example, Jesus should fill all things. Great, I follow Jesus individually. Yeah, but were you a witness in your job? Were, were, you, were you salt and light in the earth? Were you making impact? So there's a tension, uh, unnecessary, unnecessary tension between the objective and the method. I believe if we see them in causality and say, we're working on these things, these critical success factors that will ultimately produce fruit. In other words, it will result in, if I develop faith, these signs and wonders will follow. If I seek signs and wonders, that's not the instruction of the scripture. They should be following us, not us seeking after them. Those are my thoughts, at least how I'm thinking through the issue. Oh, that's excellent. thought it was great. Love it. Definitely tracking together. Um, yeah, we could make disciples, but what is the point of making disciples if we're not sending them out? If they're not winning souls, if we're not multiplying. So it's always supposed to be a movement, um, which means by implication, I mean, I'm moving right now. If I wasn't moving, I'd be dead. If, you know, I couldn't move at all, I'd be useless. I'd be functionally dead, if not biologically dead. So revival implies that there's no movement. So that's good stuff. Anybody else comment, question on this? One of the things I'm seeing, uh, Bishop, as, as you were sharing, is that there was an implication in the discipleship of Jesus as he walked with them and modeled the way um, that when they started to go out in their ministry, uh, they were automatically seeking out people. So, so somewhere inherent in that discipleship process was an understanding that we are to reach Jerusalem, Samaria, unto the uttermost parts of the earth. That was implied in the teaching, in the apostles' doctrine. So um, what are, a lot of what we're doing, if we would just look at the fruit of it, there's very little evangelism, evangelism very little discipleship. So um, our model is off in many cases because we're not seeing the fruit of our purported uh, discipleship methods. So just look at our fruit. If we're not getting the fruit that Jesus got with his disciples, then we need to go back, and I believe that, I, rather I agree with you wholeheartedly, that the church needs to look at, uh, sit down, talk with leadership, pray about, and ask the right questions. You know, why are we praying? Why do we partake of the Lord's Supper? Why are we fellowshipping? You know, and, and really go back and get back to the apostles' doctrine, because uh, the scripture says, like you mentioned, they devoted themselves to that. And you can see the rollout was when Stephen or Stephen went out, he went out preaching, he went out teaching, and there was great, uh, a great move of God in Samaria or, or wherever it is that he went. Um, why? Because he was taught. And in, in that teaching, in the apostles' doctrine, there was always that understanding that there was going to be not just the personal and corporate worship, not only uh, the group worship and the group dynamic of fellowship, but also uh, the external going out and sharing Christ with others. So, uh, yeah, I agree that we need to, all of us, need to look at our systems and, uh, like Pastor Steve was saying, deal with that balance and deal with that tension. Yeah. Great. Uh, I agree. Uh, Bishop, what I'm hearing is that we actually need a revival of a true catechism process. We need a revival of getting back to people being grounded in the apostles' doctrine. Uh, signs and wonders and miracles and awakening are tools for harvest. Uh, they bring people in. They uh, cause people to be massively aware of God, but they're not tools for grounding. 
uh, people are grounded and trained in the apostles' doctrine. So uh, I think in some ways the cart has been before the horse, but I think a both and reality and a both and strategy is very valid and very important. So I think we're we're tracking with you in that respect. Yeah. Any pushback? Anybody else? Concerns? Well, I would just wonder, and I think this is a great dialogue, uh, but I would just wonder, is there any historical evidence of a great move of God that wasn't rooted in dynamic prayer and the power of the Spirit? Like, do we see rapid church growth, multiplication of disciples that's not fueled by like some type of movement of the Holy Spirit? And I'm not saying it has to fit in the typical paradigm of the Western Pentecostal church service model, but it would seem to me like the explosive growth we see globally um, in the house church movement and things like that, they seem to incorporate in a sense prayer for awakening, the moving of the spirit, the power of God, and even in evangelical revivals, it seems like there is manifestations of God's presence, glory, power, even when they are strong on Bible teaching and repentance and maybe a clear and more sound gospel doctrinally than some of the Pentecostals or Charismatics may preach. Um, it seems like they always end up tapping into some uh, move of the spirit um, and embracing some type of spiritual gift. So I've wrestled with this a lot as we're in the, um, in the build cohort and going through the Antioch schools material and everything. Uh, and I, I see it as like I, that we have to have some type of both. And I think we're missing the discipleship and the systematic teaching uh, more than we're missing in, at least in like my church or the church culture I've been a part of in the Pentecostal world, we're missing that part more. Um, and so, but I feel like, uh, I guess I feel like we, we need both. Um, but if we don't ground people, um, I'm seeing a lot of people swayed by bad doctrine, especially uh, I've seen a lot of people following, you know, like Paul says, you're going to, they're going to heap up teachers. Well, I see people heaping up prophets, especially and other itinerant teachers. And, you know, they're, they're getting pulled into pray more for like national revival, but they're mixing it with like patriotism. And I know we've talked about that a lot on the table lately, uh, but they're not grounded in the word and it's actually getting them off. It's actually distracting Christians from making disciples, building healthy families, influencing their neighbors, serving the poor in our communities and influencing the culture from the bottom up. So I think that that could be a distraction in our revival and awakening meetings that we think we're changing the city when we have big meetings, but we're actually not serving and penetrating the different areas of culture that we need to um, in our neighborhood. So I think we have to be, we have to be watchful that we, I don't, that we keep, I don't even want to say balance, but that we have a more holistic um, perspective. Yeah, good stuff. And, you know, when it comes to, you know, looking at church history, um, when you're looking at a country that's already been Christianized, there wouldn't have been a <clears throat> awakening. For example, Martin Luther and his Reformation was an awakening. Uh, so I don't know of a great move of prayer before that Reformation, but what God used was great teaching. Um, catechesis and uh, then John Calvin took it to another level with his institutes um, so uh, and then you have reform movements within the Catholic Church in the 11th century uh, that in Cluny especially there was a monastic movement within the Catholic Church but the focus was on not awakening but renewal of the doc of, of, of relationship with God and pietism as opposed to corruption in the church. Um, but when you get to, uh, you get to, and the other thing is the reformers didn't believe that the great commission was for today. They believed that um, Matthew 28, 19, Mark 16, was already fulfilled with the first century church. So they didn't have any missional in, impetus at all. They believed that everybody was Christian and that there was heathen countries and perhaps the hyper understanding of predestination. They thought, well, maybe, you know, God didn't choose those people, but there was no impetus for awakening because of the teaching they had. 
you have a renewal movement in the 17th century with Jacob Spenner, August Frank in Hale University because they saw the Lutheran church is dead. And so they talked about having a personal relationship with God, piety, and that you had to have the witness in your spirit to be saved as opposed to you're born a Christian because you're a Lutheran. So you had renewal movements, but that gave birth to the revivalists Mm -hmm. of George, the ones who really blow, blow it open was George Whitfield and John Wesley in the 18th century. Mm -hmm. And they preached a salvation message. They didn't assume anyone was born again. They went outside the Anglican church, and the Anglican church threw them out, and they just went out. That was the best thing that God did that, getting mm -hmm. them thrown out, because now they went to the coal miners, they preached outside, they preached on top of scaffolds, and they preached to 20, 30,000 one point, Whitfield might have preached to 50,000 without a microphone. Um, and then you have uh, that great awakening. So they were, there were probably others, but building upon the pietistic movement, they believed that everybody had to be born again as opposed to, um, they didn't believe or assume people were Christian just because they lived in America. So that was one thing or lived in England. And the second thing, you have people like Charles Finney who built upon that revivalistic history and brought a second great awakening. So some of the great moves of God did come from teaching. Um, and also the other thing we have to understand, if a historian who's writing about Calvin or Martin Luther or Augustine or all these people isn't charismatic, he's not even going to delve into a possibility that there was a lot of fasting and prayer before this happened. You'll get that more from African theologians and what, uh, Latin American theologians. Uh, and then I guess the last thing I'll say is St. Anthony, uh, the first popular desert father in the third century. He's an African, by the way. He went away into the wilderness and he lived there and he battled demons. And when he came out, there were signs and wonders and move, great movement that saved a lot of people. That is still the theology or the methodology we see a lot of in Africa. Um, so it also depends on the context. And again, I don't want to make anyone think I'm against praying for awakening or moving in signs and wonders. I think Steve, uh, well, both John and Steve said it well. We can't have one without the other. We can't just focus on awakening, but neglect all the other stuff, which I think is actually harder than praying and fasting. I mean, I, to me, it's a lot easier to go on a 30-day fast and pray for awakening than it is to deal with all the garbage and coming up with systems and processes of taking people and making them disciples. I mean, that is hard. That doesn't mean I don't fast and pray for 30 days, but I can't just do one without the other. Steve, you wanted to say something? You're, you're muted. You're muted. Yeah, one tool to um, that that we that we've created with an attempt to try to do this successfully, to have this balance, to to put goals and methods together, uh, was inspired by one of the theological readings in the Build curriculum. And unfortunately, I don't know which one it was, but we frame everything that we do in mentoring in our schools and leadership development in discipleship around three words, and there are three types of goals. The first one is knowing, second becoming third doing and it's really helped us and i think it applies to this conversation because the knowing is what does an individual need to know what doctrine what understanding what biblical teaching what historical perspectives what cultural lenses just what do we need to understand what does heaven need us to know the second though is the is the least common of all three and that's actually becoming the thing that we are to become if you don't become it, now you just have head knowledge and you can't produce something. And the third is the doing goals. Now, can you with skill be able to actually do what you are called to do? So the greatest scripture to think about the simple is Matthew 21, 21. I, I need to know if I have faith and don't doubt I can move a mountain. But that doesn't mean I can move it. I just know about it. But have I become the person who has the faith and no doubt? 
And then if I have, now I can go and do it. The context of this issue is if I pray for awakening, for revival or renewal, but the church doesn't know how to do that or what to do, I'm not going to accomplish it. If the church knows what to do, but they haven't become that witness of Christ, they haven't become that, that charismatic community to the world, how are they going to actually have an awakening? So I think for me, if I frame those three words, it's just one way of thinking about it, or those three types of goals, it helps me to try to get at the balance between that unnecessary tension of both end, you know, uh, this or that. It, they, they need to work in concert with one another. Oh, that's good. Good stuff, man. Great tidbits here from all of you. Anybody else? Comment, question? Yeah, I think um, during this time of COVID has been really a work that the Lord's doing in um, what you're sharing about going back. I was talking to somebody last night, going back to just pure discipleship. Because without the big church that we're used to, without all the programming, without all the American Hollywood style approach, this has been, you know, God purifying the church in America and giving us the opportunity to go back to simply developing our relationship with him, discipling the people that's in our inner circle, because that's really all that we're really close to right now, our family, our friends, um, so I, uh, I see that this is opportunity. Uh, there's prophecies that have been going for years about the nameless, faceless, placeless generation. You know, one of the negatives of revival, the positives have it came out of a lot of prayer, you know, their awakening, but then it often became personality driven. And then there was always a great fallout. You know, I believe we're coming to a time where so many people are going, are going to come out of this thing on fire it's going to be so many great leaders that just come out of nowhere you know and and there's going to be much more of a movement of people rather than a movement of individuals and churches that are just known for being on tv or whatever um we're coming out of that americanized hollywood version of christianity into the real kingdom where it is just simply as we saw it back in the times of Jesus, you know, making disciples and yes, prayer will be involved. Preaching the word will be involved, but I think it's been way over complex in America. And, um, and I think God's doing a great work through COVID. I've experienced it in my life, my family and our church. And uh, I'm expecting great things as we come out of this COVID. Yeah. Definitely. And um, you are hitting a lot of important points as we contextualize the world we're in. There's never going to be one, you know, playbook, so to speak, you know, like Steve is talking about methodologies. There's always going to be universal principles. Like we always need small groups. We always need prayer, fellowship, uh, discipleship, doctrine. There are certain universal things, but how we apply it and to what extent we focus on it also depends on the context and the crisis. If you're in a huge crisis, uh, you could have the greatest programs and discipleship, but that's the time to fast and pray and do some spiritual warfare, right? You got to focus on that. That doesn't mean that you throw out everything that you've been doing up until that time. You got to just pick it up again. But there are also times and seasons when God is focusing on things like with Martin Luther, the main thing God had to do was, was teaching, proper teaching, because what good is the fasting and praying if people didn't even know how to get saved? They didn't know justification by faith. They didn't know that, uh, you know, idols were wrong and uh, the, uh, the things that they were doing were so crazy that there had to be a revival of teaching. So it also depends on what season we're in as a local church. I think the charismatic movement right now, and I'm just gonna submit this, the season is proper discipleship and teaching. Um, not that we don't fast and pray, but you know, you can tell all these people fast and pray, but if they don't 
dive into the word of God and get taught and sit under seasoned leaders, they're going to be fasting and praying for things that are not even aligned with God's will a lot of times. So, um, but so that's also something we have to contextualize everything. Um, anybody else? We have about eight minutes before we move into the global table. Any other comments? Joe, besides, uh, Bishop Matera, beside the, uh, the build and the apostolic training, is there any other kind of um, proven method? Well, let me ask it this way. Do you know of any movements or people that are doing both equally balanced that have, that are using the tools for harvest, that have a great deal of awakening, but that are really steeped in uh, catechism and discipleship and training? Any models out there, are those who are doing it really well, do you know of or anyone else know of? I think that our collective here is attempting to do that. We have 18 to 20 that get with me for three hours a month uh, and do serious theological uh, discussions in addition to this. Um, and uh, several of our churches are doing that with their own people as, as well as I do every Thursday. I do that with a lot of people in our church. Um, I think some of the Anglican churches have tried to do the alpha and certain teachings and move in the spirit. Um, I don't know how strong it is in Latin America and Africa. I'm not sure about how strong Brazil, uh, what I've seen uh, in a lot of places is it's more of a simple, you know, healing, get saved, prosperity message, and there's not that much real teaching, which lends itself to syncretism. They could mix things of the world in the gospel, whether it's politics or, you know, even paganism. Um, there's some syncretism going on in, in some of these places where there's a huge global reach. Jeff Reed deals with that in his encyclical on the strategic spirit, how the global Pentecostal movement is in danger of really um, flatlining soon if they don't have a lot of discipleship, biblical discipleship. It's not easy to find a place that fits that balance, um, you know, and I'm sure there are, and um, there definitely are movements that are definitely attempting that, but that would be a good conversation to, to look for models that are doing that. Um, and, um, you know, obviously one of our models in the main model we have is the book of Acts and the epistles. So thank God we have something there as a reference, but that's a great question, Kyle. It's worthy of more discussion. Um, and, uh, you might see a lot of discipleship and dis disciple making proliferation in the underground church in Iran, in um, China. You might have more of that in places that are not well known than what we see in America. Quite frankly, uh, you probably have that more likely in a persecuted environment than you would here because they have to depend on signs, wonders, miracles, faith just to survive. At the same time, they have to make disciples in small groups because they can't meet in big churches. So more likely you're going to see that balance in the underground church. Doesn't mean we can't do it here. Amen. Good, good dialogue here. Good dialogue. Um, we got room for one more comment, question. Okay, um, so my suggestion would be, um, I mean, if you want to get the book, Essays in Apostolic Leadership, it deals with wineskin. Um, I know Kyle Watkins is on and he's been blessed by looking through that. I don't know, Kyle, are you there? Are you still born again? Hey, good morning. 
You still born again? Still married? Still holding on. <laughs> All right. Well, you you look great in that picture. What happened to your gi? I like the gi better. <laughs> you ripped it the last time we trained. That's why I haven't seen you in a while. <laughs> um, my you my say sponsors told me how much more gis do you need? I told him this bishop keeps tearing me apart. Well, one day you, you'll get me a deal with Nike. How's that? <laughs> Sure, I'll definitely do that. I love the conversation today, Bishop. This was great. Yeah, does, I mean, that book, Apostolic Essays, I don't know how much you've gone through it. Has that helped you with understanding wineskin issues? Oh, it's tremendous. And I love how, you know, not only the book, but the conversation last week, really, see how the two are interconnected and intertwined into one another. Um, you know, here in Long Island, we've we've seen a lot of churches just kind of dwindle away because of the, I guess you can say the fascination with the wine, as opposed to the wine skin. Uh, these churches are more or less into the, uh, not the system, but really the, um, I guess you can say the sensation of having church, shouting, dancing, as you said, speaking in tongues, etc., we're not seeing a lot of disciples being made. We, we are experiencing something tremendous in our church. And that is by the numbers, our ministry is growing. And it has nothing to do with how well we have church, but how well we're being the church. Uh, people are joining our ministry from other churches. And at one point, Bishop, I got to be honest with you. I turned to the Lord in prayer and I said, Father, again, so many people from different churches. I know this person. I know that person. Some of them are even pastors. Lord, what's going on here? And I believe the Lord laid on my heart. They desire to be discipled. Your church is discipling. They're tired of the sensational, um, I guess you can say, feeling of the wine. They are ready for the wineskin. They want discipleship. So I do believe, Bishop, and I concur with you, that I do believe in the charismatic churches, we're going to see a revival, as Kyle Searcy said, of systems the revival of programs, the revival of discipleship, maybe not so much people. Yeah, well, let me end with this. I remember when the um, uh, there was uh, at a Lakeland, we got hit, our church got hit with a movement of laughter and it hit before I think even got to Toronto. And um, so one of the local pastors uh, was bragging. I was kind of like mentoring about 20 or 30 pastors at that point in the um, early 90s. I was in touch with a lot of them. And the um, one pastor told me, he was saying, yeah, we haven't, we, we just been laughing for three months. I haven't even preached in three months. And I warned him, I said, brother, you got to get a hold of your, you know, you got to get a hold of this thing. I said, um, if you don't start preaching, you're not going to have a church in six months. And he didn't listen to me. He was arrogant. Oh, no, no, we're in this great move of God. And sure enough, in six months, he had a huge church split. His church doesn't exist anymore. Exactly. You cannot have the wine without the wine skin. Yeah. Okay, let's um, transition to the uh, global table and... I'm going to try to find the elusive Vince Thomas. He's like Elijah. You never know where he is. Uh, there he is. I found him. He's on the bottom there. Okay. So Vince, why don't you segue into the global table for us? I sure will. And good morning, everyone. It's so glad to uh, be with everyone today. So glad to be able to be a part of all of our conversations that we're having. Um, as we are preparing for um, this table, I want to invite you to um, share this broadcast as we're getting ready to prepare to go on Facebook as well as YouTube and to stream out. Um, and uh, as we're doing that, also inside the comments, just let us know where you're tuning in from. Uh, as always, all of our meetings, everything that we do is housed on uscal.us. So you're able to go back and you're able to watch uh, the, the discussions, you're able to take notes, things that you may have missed the first time. You're able to see them today. So 
Um, we're glad to have each of you on and uh, looking forward to a great conversation uh, with Bishop Joe interviewing Randy Clark, as well as we'll close out in prayer. So uh, back to you, Bishop Joe. Yeah, um, a lot of our brothers and sisters are experiencing some real uh, crises during this season. And uh, like John Kelly and others are displaced, I think he might have even left Dallas because there's no, no electricity. Um, so we want to open up in prayer for our brothers and sisters who are really struggling right now uh, due to weather and other things that are going on. So uh, Vince, why don't you just uh, lift them up and whatever God lays on your heart, just open in prayer for that. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so Heavenly Father, as we are all joining together with our brothers and sisters who are throughout this entire country facing uh, just harsh weather and harsh circumstances subsequent to the weather, uh, Lord, we're asking that you be with them, uh, those who are leading churches and congregations. Father, may you give them insight as to how to directly reach the people that are within their community. Father, we uh, just uh, lift up the response teams that will be going in to restore water, restore power, uh, restore connectivity through cell phone towers. Uh, Lord, we're just asking that right now, Father, there, there be no unnecessary loss of life, Father, that this be a swift um, uh, recovery of lost needs, Father. We pray right now for our meeting today, every leader that's on the call, uh, God, there, there's such complexity during the season, so we're asking you, instead of complexity, that we exchange that for your clarity uh, and divine direction. So help us do these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay. Um, I'm wondering, I can't see everybody for some reason. I'm trying to come on the participant thing, and it's just showing me chats. But is John Kelly on before we start? John Kelly, are you on? Okay. I don't know if he's on. Can someone see if there's an, it says iPhone? I can't see anybody's name. I didn't, I didn't see one on. Okay. All right. I just wanted to get an update as to how he's doing and how others we know are doing in Dallas. I'm, you know, concerned about that. All right. Well, Let's begin. And if he does come on before the end, let me know and we will uh, definitely bring him on to share about what's going on, how he's doing. Will do. Okay. Thank you, guys. All right. So we're going to be continuing our discussion on the crises in the charismatic church. And the crises in the charismatic church has a lot of underlining issues. Things have fomented recently, but it doesn't mean that it is of a recent development. There's been things fomenting for decades, uh, imbalances, maybe lack of teaching, maybe focusing on the wine instead of the wine and the wine skin. There are many, many things. And as I was saying in a previous table, uh, I also believe often in the charismatic movement, we focus on awakening and praying and fasting for the community while neglecting the, the very arduous task of serious ordered learning and, and discipleship in the church. Um, so we need to continue to pray, believe God for awakening, but not let that be the only thing we do as local churches. We have to make disciples. Here with us is a Dr. Randy Clark, whom I've just recently met and uh, always been an admirer of him and uh, like the great balance he has as a person who is a biblical scholar, but at the same time moves in the power of God. That's always something I've tried to do. Um, you know, Jesus said that we are in error when we know not the scriptures nor the power of God. And some people just focus on the power and some people focus just on the scriptures. And that, that's, that you could even divide the body of Christ into those dimensions and see cessationists who are great theologians in many ways, but neglect the spirit. And then you got charismatics who wouldn't know the word exegesis if it met them in the street. Um, and, uh, and then you have what Jesus said in John four, 
that the Father desires people to worship him both in spirit and in truth, not just truth and not just spirit. And I believe Randy really understands this. Um, and so, Randy, um, what do you make of the current charismatic crises? Or maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there is no crises. What, what do you think? I don't know if I would call it a crisis, or at least I wouldn't call it a crisis just in the last few years. I think it's a, a, a need for maturing and uh, self-correction. And I think uh, a need to clarify from within and naming what things that, from our perspective rather than let other people give us names. Um, I think all that's important. I think that there are things that deals with uh, both the prophecy and apostolic that are important issues that needs to be uh, looked at. And, um, I, and I think it's really strange, not strange, but interesting that um, within the last few months, I believe is on uh, charisma, the, the, uh, the media page more than the, it wasn't really the, like the magazine but a media page it had a whole list just you know as i'm scrolling down and it was all these persons who are uh there, there's somebody doing excerpts from something they said about prophecy and and one of them was talking about the coming judgments and another one was talking about why um it's wrong to think that there's any judgment at all and and then two or three in between. And just on that one day, you had this great diversity of, of uh, competing and contradictory positions, all from well-known prophetic people. And I think that's uh, creating some confusion and uh, uh, creating a, um, more doubt, on the, especially on the part of those that's not traditionally been within the continuations position, whether that'd be a Pentecostal, a charismatic, or a third wave evangelical. Um, it's, so I think it's uh, some of the things of late has uh, contributed to that, but not just since the election, but even before the election, it's just this differences of in positions. Sometimes a friend of mine who's well known, um, he told me one time, he said, you know, Randy, one of the things that troubles me is sometimes even in, in like conference I had, a prophetic conference, said you had people who got up and gave opposite positions and the people amen both times <laughs> and weren't, didn't, weren't aware. You know, <laughs> And, and, and so I think there is some of that that's uh, we're all, you know, not, not that we want that, but, the, but it is part of the reality that um, I think it, it will, I think, work itself out. But there is going to be need to try to, I think, um, do a better job at discipling um, in this in, in, of the church as a whole. And I think uh, doing a better job of discussing some of these issues of, uh, among ourselves and trying to come to some resolution. I know that one of the things that I'm working on right now, and I, I you know, if you're interested or if I think I saw, I think I saw John Kelly come on just a while ago. I think he's iPhone one, I think. Um, but anyway, um, I just talked to five, uh, some people in Brazil. One of them's got 700 churches. The other's got 500 churches. And the other's got 400 churches. And the other's got thousands of churches in their network. And I'm, I'm encouraging them to participate in a survey uh, that's basically sent to each, each network to be separate so that we can identify not only by continent but by or country, but by also apostolic uh, streams, networks, so that we can find out of some of the things that uh, has been critical of the uh, charismatic churches, um, if whether or not the criticism has any sense of validity to it or very little validity, uh, or if there's just such a diversity that it, in some places it's, it, there's some valid criticism and other places it's just a smokescreen for saying this is what they believe when we actually don't believe that at all. So 
I, I, that's where I'm coming from is let's, let's try to deal with it. Uh, clarify who we are. Uh, I was reading a, a dissertation from a guy in Africa. Uh, I think his last name is Rizane or something like that. Um, but he was saying that for Pentecostals and charismatics and, and which would be inclusive of the new apostolic, uh, networks, um, one of the big issues is ecclesiology, you know, how we understand church and how we understand the, the relationship of the um, structure of church and the offices, you know, the fivefold offices and stuff. And, and I don't agree with his criticism, but, you know, he was saying uh, his coming from a reform perspective uh, w that there isn't an ecclesiology. It's just all over the board. Now, that may be true, it's all over the board, but I think we might find out that there's a whole lot more unity than what we know of because we just haven't um, spoken to each other enough to find out what's, what's believed. So that's my perspective on the present crisis is that it's nothing that can't, can't be used to, uh, to refine the church and for especially the continuationist part to become even stronger and healthier. Yes. So would you say that every crisis is an opportunity for us to mature? Yeah, I would. Have you we seen can... that in, in, in the last few decades? Have you seen cycles of this at times? Yes. Uh, you know, in the, I, I think there's things we've learned, like if we're looking at the charismatic movement or the continuationist movement as a whole over the last since 1960, we say, let's say um, with Dennis Bennett as the beginning, even whether it's the beginning or not, it's the recognized beginning of the charismatic movement in April of 1960. Um, and so for the first 20 years from through the 60s and the 70s, the, a bulk of the uh, movement of the charismatic movement was charismatic renewal and it was within the mainline denominations, because uh, so you have Pentecostalism over here is and it's refined now as classical Pentecostalism in their denominations. And not that there's not an impact on some of those churches that did bring change to them as well. But then you have the, the traditional mainline churches and the charismatic renewal seems to have been working in them primarily uh, for about 20 years. And, um, one of the things that I think we learned from it, I hope we learned from it, was that um, when the denominations chose to try to accommodate the charismatic renewal by creating small groups, that the charismatics within their congregations can meet in those small groups and have their tongue speaking and worship with hands raised and all that they do, but that wasn't to come into the congregational liturgy congregational worship service, keep it out there, that, and, and that was kind of a, a, a way of not losing the members, you know, the ties would stay in the local church, and they wouldn't lose the people, but still, they would be insulated and not be able to impact so much the rest of the church. That didn't bode well for the charismatic renewal itself, um, because uh, I, in St. Louis, there was a, where I lived for 16 years and pastored, there was a very strong charismatic movement within Catholicism and St. Louis was the strongest practicing Catholic city in the United States. That's why the Pope often wanted to go there. Um, not that it's the strongest percentage wise, but it's the strongest practicing Catholic city. And uh, it's very strong. And uh, several years ago, um, I was invited to go to their main meeting and uh, the, uh, the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, Ralph Martin was one of the speakers and I was the other speaker. And I have to say that when I was there, I actually felt a, um, a grief a, because as I looked around, that which had been such a powerful move within Catholicism in the city of St. Louis was now basically everybody was like I am now, gray headed. You know, there's very, very few young people there. And, um, and, and as I looked at it, I, I could see that that strategy hadn't bode well for the, for the, for the movement. 
uh, in St. Louis. Now, I am grateful that I'm seeing new things coming out. I'm seeing, you know, uh, a young priest in uh, Detroit who's at the seminary prof professor seminary and a young lay person that we prayed for down in Orlando. And uh, God really touched them. And they're now being used to, to train future priests to go, but he takes them out on the street to pray for the sick and prophesy. And, and uh, you know, so there are new encouraging signs. Um, and, and especially with Pope Francis, who himself is charismatic, there's more openness. Um, on the other hand, in that first 20 years, there's a lot of good things that helped, particularly with the Anglicans and how it affected the whole world. Uh, you know, in, in Africa, for example, the Anglican priests that are charismatic really have a big influence. So I would say what we learned from that first 10 years in the 60s and, and, and maybe into the 70s, was even though there was trying to maintain the, the renewal, if it never got to impact the, the whole congregation, it rarely worked and often ended up eventually uh, spinning out and then uh, forming a new charismatic church or just withering within. And where it seems to have worked well is where the, in the high, in the, uh, the mainline churches, whether they're Catholic, Anglican or Lutheran or whatever, if they were able to have a service at the congregational level, that was an option to where it was moved out from siloing it into these uh, small groups alone, then it, it, was, it was able to be much, much more healthier for the congregation uh, as a whole. The other thing I think that we learned in the 70s, which, which is what I think that some of you guys are wanting to do now, is the need to, for self-correction. and the National Charismatic Concerns, I think it was called the, or the Charismatic Concerns Committee, they're still in existence, but it was a, all, a lot of the key leaders and they brought the key leaders from both uh, mainline churches and, uh, and they were meeting to discuss what went wrong with the um, shepherding movement and came away from that with a, a statement of agreement of here's where we've gone wrong, here's where there's been repentance for what was, was wrong and, and it was a way forward. And, and, uh, and that, that group, I think is, uh, I know is still in existence. A friend of mine actually leads it. So there was a, an attempt to bring self, um, self correction, which I think is always better than trying to receive correction from the outside. Cause from the outside, you know, there's, there's a tendency that we would have a wall up because we would sense that they're, um, we could become defensive because they're actually offensive on the offensive. And sometimes they are offensive uh, and have an ax to grind, so to speak. So it's, you know, it's the, the, the correction from a brother is sometimes hard, but it's the best kind because you know that they've got the best interests of our, of the movement itself at, um, at large. I, I know that as I speak to that, back in the 90s, Wimber, John Wimber told me that uh, I had a sermon called Jesus, and it was, um, it was in the height of the renewal in uh, Toronto at the time for the first 18 months. And when I met with Wimber privately, he said, you know, that's my favorite sermon of the whole messages that he'd heard had been taught. And it was actually a self-corrective message. And... Uh, so it basically was saying Jesus should be the focus of our mountaintop experience. Jesus should be the focus of our preaching. Jesus should be the focus of our healing. And the last one was where the corrective was coming in. And it was Jesus should be the focus of our worship, not the four living creatures. Our focus <laughs> on animal sounds is supposed to be upon the, the, the lamb that becomes the lion that, that's uh, worshipped on the throne, you know, not the... Not you know, the living creatures. So <laughs> that was meant to be a corrective to the, to the prophetic side that was going on then, because a lot of that was coming out of the prophetic, you know, the, you know, the, each of them was, was acting out and things, but it wasn't, it wasn't meant to say nothing in this is good. It was, it was like, let's bring some correction to it. So, so I think there, there have been things that we could learn. Uh, and I think that uh, as you were talking or someone was talking earlier before it started about um, the need to disciple. And as you were talking to somebody about that somebody hadn't preached in three months, well, that's just stupid. Uh, that's, you know, 
I, what I found, if we would focus on what the wine was for, that the power was onto something and we could move past just focusing on having a drinking party to uh, what, what, is, what is this unto? And if we focused on that uh, so that the people who are being touched, because I, I, what I saw as I traveled now for 26 years and been involved in a lot of this, the churches where the leaders focused it on mercy ministries, on missions, on evangelism, and there was a focus that this is to enable us to be able to do these things, which I think is much more uh, biblical. That was healthy. Where the focus was only on re the experience, but not focused on experience for what, that became unhealthy. And, and in the churches where it was just focused on, let's just get drunk together and get drunk in the spirit, it died out very fast. In the churches where the focus is on, we need the power of God to be able to do what God's called us to do. They were able to sustain a long time of, of both. I need the power because I've been utilizing it for God's uh, purpose and his glory. And, uh, and as we do that, we can, we can uh, need to be filled afresh. Um, it lasted and is much more healthier. So I, oh. I what no if you had something else on that go ahead no i mean that that that's fine so you talked about the in, the impact the charismatic movement had before they segmented their groups uh what kind of impact did the third wave have on the church the general evangelical church and charismatic church yeah um so if you go from the 60s through the 70s when you in the in the focus on renewal then it began to be focused on church planting and at the same time that there was this transformation a sense of re focus on renewal within the mainline churches to now starting new independent charismatic churches and by the way just one of my pet peeves is i i it runs me nuts when they say you can use a capital p for pentecostalism but you, you must use a little c for charismatic movement in writing and, and I, i'm saying well you're allowing your north american context to blind you to even your rule because across the world there are charismatic denominations just like there's pentecostal denomination in north america you're just not aware of it so i'm writing from a world perspective we need to use a capital c this thing it's much bigger so there's, a, there's around 300 and some 305 million charismatics and around of 500 million uh, what we call continuations, which would include the classical Pentecostals, third wave evangelicals, third wave movement, and, and the charismatic. Wagner says... One that, dog to the other. Okay. Better make sure everybody's muted. That's the one dog. Speaking. Okay. Got it. Oh, Go ahead. So, so Wagner, Peter Wagner said it, in his opinion, the third wave movement began around 1985. That's the one I know the most about. I was American Baptist um, I had spoken in tongues at 19. I, I wasn't baptized in the spirit till, uh, the vineyard came to my Baptist church in 84 in March. And, um, um, and then I've filled it again in 89 and then again in 93 at, at uh, Rod, through Rodney Howard Brown at, uh, Rama, which was not where I would have chosen to go, but God had to deal with some of my issues on that. So I, I do think that the, the third wave movement is a very powerful movement. I'm concerned that it, it's actually um, allowed, it, allowed other people to, well, not, I said that wrong, allowed some of the people in the movement to make the movement more narrow than what it is. Let me explain that. The third wave movement is, is usually it's evangelicals that are not classical Pentecostal in, in saying that um, tongues is the necessary initial evidence of the baptism of the Spirit, though they're open to all the gifts, and, and probably almost all of them speak in tongues, too. Um, like in my case, it just wasn't, you know, I, I spoke in tongues before I was baptized in the Spirit, and I know other people that spoke in tongues when they were baptized, and I celebrate that. I'm not, I'm not against tongues at all. I'm not against tongues being a sign of the baptism of the Spirit either. Um, 
but being in a third wave position, I wouldn't say it's, it's the only way or the only sign. Uh, however, having said that, some of the key leaders in the vineyard movement, Rich Nathan and Ken Wilson, who wrote the book Empowered Evangelicals, um, in it talked about this as they wrote as if this was the official uh, vineyard position. And I'm going somewhere with this. And so they said that the consummate experience of the Holy Spirit, I'm trying to paraphrase here, is conversion, in which at which time we receive all that there is. So I read that and I went to meet John Wimber. It was the last time I met him before he died. And I was in the vineyard at the time. And I said, John, I just got to ask you, is this where is this our position? Because if this is our position, we have to sign something that says this is what we believe. I got to leave the vineyard because I can't sign this. I can't say that everybody receives the baptism of the Spirit the moment they're saved any more than I can sign the Assemblies of God position. Because I thought you said, and I've heard you teach, that there's diversity in the New Testament itself. And I thought, John, that you believe that it could be but even more so, more often, is subsequent to conversion. And uh, he looked at me and smiled and said, you're right, that is what I believe. And I don't agree with what was written. I said, well, then if you don't say something, the vineyard movement is going to be perceived as third wave means, uh, or empowered evangelicals third wave means this very narrow definition of when you're baptized in the Spirit. I don't think he ever actually got to address that. So the movement itself now is seen to be third wave. A lot of them say it, you believe you receive everything there is at conversion. I believe that's a wrong understanding of third wave. I think third wave is you believe mainly people come out of mainline denominations that are continuous, continualist or continuationist, believe all the gifts for today. Um, many of them, as I believe, even the, all the office gifts of Ephesians 4 are for today as well. Um, and who would um, believe in the, the, all the gifts of the Spirit are for today and, and that they have continued. And, um, and so I think that it's an extremely powerful movement. And a lot of people were added to the charismatic movement that was now coming from the Reformed uh, Baptist side because of uh, the, the the two conferences James Robinson had in, in Dallas, Texas in 80, 84 and 85, um, or a December 83 or January 84, and two years in a row. And I saw thousands of Baptist people there, and many of them later were heavily involved in the third wave movement because they, they were powerfully touched at, at that meeting. So I, I think it is... Um, an important move of God. And one of the things that, that sometimes we had to face is many of the people who were touched in that were well-trained theologically and biblically, as they were in many of the people who were coming out of the mainline denominations as, as well. And so what was seen is, okay, now we, we have a good foundation. Now we need to teach about being able to prophesy and heal and, and these things of the Spirit, which we didn't get in seminary. But what happened is, is often that, that became what was so focused on that a generation rose up in the churches where the leaders originally were well-trained in those areas. And now another area of leadership, they, they're really good at prophesying. They're really good at moving in the gifts of Spirit, but they're really not so good at hermeneutics or uh, homiletics or theology or biblical studies and and because of that there are some things that's being done that just are detrimental because they're they're moving away from just solid biblical on so that leads me to another question and uh then after that we'll if john kelly's on we'll hear how he's doing and we'll pray um so you are a, a scholar but at the same time, you move in the power of God. You believe in healing, casting out demons. Your world is not a narrow world like many theologians. It's more like the enlightenment. You know, the empirical world is how they interpret scripture. Basically, an anti-supernaturalist, even if they're continualist, the theological focus oftentimes 
uh, looks at signs and wonders as, on, as only an anomaly or God could do it, but we shouldn't always, you know, we shouldn't expect God to do it. So how do you as a scholar keep the balance between believing God, moving in the super, supernatural and, and having scholarship in your life? Is that a hard balancing act? It's easy for you. It's easy. How do you, how do, you do it? It's easy. Once you once for me, the the, the aha moment came, came when I was about 20, uh, 25. And I was my last year of, uh, in my master's program at a Southern Baptist Seminary at Louisville, which was at that time a bastion of liberalism instead of a, a reformed theology as it is today. And I had this course called biblical authority in the modern mind. So I'm, I'm reading uh, this book called The Historian and the, and the Believer, which was about the difficulty between the historian and then the believer believing the scriptures and the historian committed to a, uh, a philosophy of history, which rules out supernatural. And, and so as I'm reading through this book by Van Harvey, um, which was in favor of the higher critical method, which basically is, I, for me, the aha, aha moment was, this is what I've been taught all the way through four years of college, a major in religion, minor, took all my lectures in religious studies, three years of seminary at the master's level. And this is all I'd been taught, higher critical method, which is not what I was raised in. I was raised a fundamentalist, dispensational, quasi cessationist Baptist. But anyway, as I'm reading it, I'm, I realize that, wait, this whole system is based upon an understanding of history because of an understanding of science, quasi-science, in my opinion, that nothing supernatural can take place. And if it is, it isn't really historical. So the historian cannot accept the supernatural. And when, when you realize that higher critical method is based on this presupposition, then for me, it's like, aha, I don't agree with this. I, I know that God healed me. I've seen God heal. And it was my healing that kept me from becoming a, a liberal. Otherwise, I probably would have because, it, you know, that's all I've been taught. But my own experience of the power of God to be healed, even though I hadn't really experienced the power of God as far as being baptized in spirit or anything yet, it caused me to be open to a supernatural realm. And it was the pursuit of the healing that caused me to open up to everything else. And, and, and now I always told somebody, I have some people that friends that want going for higher education. I said, listen, if you're going to go to a school that's liberal in the sense of it's I'm not talking politically, but theologically, and, and for whatever reason, if you're going there, what you need to do first is make sure you, you know, go with us on some trips. You need to see some blind eyes open, some deaf ears open. You need me to talk to some people who's been raised from the dead. You need to talk to some people who, who raised them from the dead. You need to be in the villages and see what, how it transposed the village. Then you could go back to those schools. And it's not going to impact you at all. I mean, you're, you're just, but if you go there to start with and you don't have this reality of understanding based upon reality, then you could easily be swayed. And so it really is that really, and I guess what I'm saying is that theology comes out of experience, even for the new Testament itself, as they were writing it, they were writing it out of their experience with God and uh, whether, where there is no experience, it's easy to be swayed by reason. But when you realize that you can reason all you want with me, but I've seen this with my own eyes. So don't tell me this stuff doesn't happen. And so I, I, I think there is a need for good education. I'm for it. I mean, we just found out yesterday that uh, the school I started is now going to be able to offer two doctoral programs. And we have several master's programs. We're just now going to be able to offer a doctor of ministry and doctor of theology accredited by CHIA and ABHE. So I'm excited. So I'm not against education. Uh, I, I, I want to raise up people who can argue well the faith and not be afraid or, or and understand the arguments and understand and watch the presuppositions behind them and, or underneath them and where they're wrong, be able to point those out. Well, that's great. I know a mutual friend of mine who passed away, uh, Bob Phillips, 
yes. uh, went with you on one of your trips. I don't remember if it was Brazil or Africa. It was. It and, was. Uh, he called me up. He was so excited. He said, Joe, I've seen a lot of healings, but you got to hear this one. I said, what? He said, there was a woman without an eye. She didn't have a, an eye that was blind. She had no eye. And he laid hands on her and he literally saw an eye form from scratch in this lady's socket. And he was like so blown away. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I think what you're doing is fabulous. I, I look forward to connecting more with you on, on a more regular basis. And you've just been such a blessing to not only our table, to the body of Christ for so many years. And what a great example of someone who moves in the power of God. I mean, there's so many things we could talk about. We have a lot of things in common. I've, I've got uh, saved in an Assembly of God dispensational church. I got trained in a cessationist, fundamentalist Baptist institute. Uh, and then I was exposed to the um, uh, word of faith in the middle 80s and then uh, got into the apostolic movement. And at the same time, uh, was really uh, mentored by the books of Kenneth Hagin, uh, Watchman E, that kind of stuff. Um, and then there were other influences that, you know, thank God I had all those influences because I understand a lot of different perspectives of the church. And of course, I was raised a Roman Catholic and was catechized. Um, so there's a lot of different streams that You're I could walking in ecumenical movement. And my grandmother was the first Hispanic woman minister in New York City history. She had a Spanish Pentecostal church from uh, in the 1920s. Um, and so, yeah, uh, that whole thing um, has given a uh, part, it has been part of my history and, my, and what I know and my legacy, whatever it is. But uh, yeah, you've just been a great inspiration and there's so much more we could talk about. Um, I'm gonna see if John Kelly is on now. He is. John? Hi. John, Papa Kelly, we want to check on you before we pray. We want to see how you're doing. Are you still in Dallas? Yeah, we're still here. And um, <clears throat> we've been without without heat, without electricity for several days. It came on uh, last night. So we're praying it stays on. And um, so it's been, it's been a struggle. And... Um, the other struggle is the uh, the death of Fernando Gillian uh, down in Brazil and uh, had a uh, tremendous work, tremendous work in Belo Horizonte, Brazil, and uh, was in many ways my right arm in, in South America and and, and uh, doing a tremendous work all over the country, uh, represented the Wagner Institute there and, and touched really his ministry literally touched over a million lives many ways and uh and he was well respected by the other apostolic leaders throughout the country and um because his ministry was much more eclectic in its function and so uh it was a shock because he's been a you know a son of mine for a number of years and um so i've been kind of kind of going through you know i was kind of i was I had a point yesterday morning where I was broken. He, he, he died early yes, yesterday morning and um, he was overcoming uh, cancer, began as a tumor on the back of his head and it penetrated the skull into the brain and he was being treated for that. And then he was supposed on monthly maintenance of chemo. And uh, then this, key, this came on and within four or five, Four, within four or five days he um, he passed and um, uh, it was anyway uh, it's, a, it's a tragic thing and um, I think that you know when something like this happens I think it causes us to not only not only look at the relationship of the loved one that has passed but also many others that have been in our life and uh, from my father to all my all my various sons, daughters in the faith, and it's just been a strange day yesterday. And um, but the power came on, uh, you know. And uh, so I'm in the car here because I had to come out here and, and get some special stuff to bring home. Um, 
listening to to Randy, listening to all of you talk. And, uh, you know, uh, I've just finished reading a book called The Fourth Wave, which talked about every 20 years that there's major change culturally in nations and uh, and how it kind of repeats itself. And I'm thinking about the early church and all the confusion that was in the early church and all and various heresies that were developed within the early church. And so, so I don't, I don't think we're talking about anything that's, that's, that's new that the church hasn't been through before, but I do, I do know one thing. I know that through all of that, through all of the persecutions of the church, through all of the, all of the harassment of the church, it's still here. And there will always be a remnant. And it's and it is and it has stayed the course of time. And I look at my I look at myself and and we talk about maturation and I think that's an important thing. And uh, Randy brought up something that uh, that's why I brought up the four, fourth wave and that is what goes around comes around. And I feel like the church is just going through various various changes. And in the beginning of the charismatic movement, it was like the wild west. And it was, I mean, I was in some crazy meetings in those days. I mean, wild, bizarre things. And some of it was God and some of it was flesh out of control. But, but then the teachers came along and all of a sudden, and, and that was called the shepherding movement. But before it got into, got into, the, into the, the, basically the, the structural part of submitting to someone, they, they, they brought teaching to the movement. And, and that began to settle people in. And I think that with the, with the restoration, you know, of the prophetic, you know, we, we, you know, we're, you know, we, we've gone somewhat to from charismatics, maybe to charis fanatics, but I also believe it's going to reform itself. I believe there, there will be, there will be reform within it. And, and we just have to, we have to give it time and, and, and certain people, uh, We'll, we'll mature and we'll rise up and, and we'll be leaders in that. And, and eventually, eventually we, we will come to a place where we have a much more, a much stronger apostolic remnant type church within the world. And I'm seeing great change in, in churches all over the world. And yes, you know, when you go to, when you go to certain countries, you know, they seem to be copying uh, some of our TV model ministries and all that, but that is changing. When I sit and talk with these leaders, and one good thing about them is they're strong leaders. And they have mega churches. And when I talk to them, whether it's in Africa, Central America, South America, wherever it is, when I talk to them, one of the things that, that I hear is it's amazing how well, how well versed they are in the word of God. And it's amazing how much they recognize what's going on in their own countries. But, but they did not realize and have a great, have a stronger revelation of the kingdom of God and how it is to penetrate within all of the cultures of their community. And we have to understand too, that the church is coming under great attack all over the world. And this is not a great time to be picking on one another. This is a time to say, hey, come on, let's work together. Let's build together. Let's war together. Let's, let's help one another rise up. This is a time for as one. That's what it is. Jesus prayed a prayer. In John 17, I believe it will come to pass that we would all be as one as he and the Father as one. The question is, will it come to pass by revelation or by persecution? Historically, a few have got it by revelation, but most catch it by persecution. I hope and pray that we all wake up to what's going on around the church and the political and cultural forces that are coming against the church and wake up and realize we have a common enemy. I played football for many years, high school. I played on championship teams and on those teams, we have boys of every race you can think of, but also we had thugs. I mean, criminals were on those teams and but we all had a common purpose, a common goal, and we went out and won games together. And, and I, I really believe that once the church wakes up and realizes 
realizes that there is a tremendous warfare and that there are forces that are circling around the church and they want to stop your voice, that's the time we will be as one. And so I have great hope. I have great faith in the leaders of the church in that there is going to be mega change taking place, but it's, but it's not going to be by any of us trying to bring correction to them, to anyone, because that that's going to cause just conflict. That's just going to cause that ha they have to have a re revelation. They have to have a realization. I know that in the past, there's some things I've said. There are things that I believe just, just a year ago, things I believe 20, 30 years ago, and I don't believe today. And somehow somebody spoke something. I read something my mind changed my mindset changed my biblical view changed my biblical worldview got became stronger and so great hope great faith and great love for all of you bless you well great great insight uh papa kelly and uh we're glad that you're okay i hope no pipes have broken in your house uh and uh uh you know they obviously weren't prepared for eight inches of snow. So <laughs> you guys were- we, we don't have any water. We don't have any water. Well, you, you should have moved to New York when you had a chance. <laughs> we're actually warmer here than, than, than over there. But oh, yep. I, I'm really sorry to see what you're going through. And of course, Fernando was a dear friend of mine. He represented me in uh, Latin America, set up trips for me negotiated with the leaders and did everything. I mean, he was just an amazing young man. And we had a lot of fun together when we traveled. Um, and um, I just was shocked. And I think he couldn't have been more than 40, right? How old was he? Um, Fernando, he was, he was 43. Yeah, so, so young. That's one of those mysteries I 40, don't understand. That's a mystery why um, that happened. Um, and uh, getting back to Randy, one other thing I was trying to remember in terms of my influences, my mother church was the first church that John Wimber ever did a power encounter in 1981, I believe it was. So I met John Wimber. I was with John for three days as a 24 year old, whatever I was, 23. With Lonnie Frisbee, I became a friend of Lonnie. Lane Cook was there uh, and others. And, um, you know, so that's also part of the, the third wave greatly impacted me uh, as a young person. But Randy, can you uh, just lead us in prayer for Papa Kelly, John Kelly, and, um, and uh, for, you know, all of us, I mean, that the body of Christ and all of us in the charismatic movement would come into maturity um, and whatever the Lord lays on your heart. So can you lead us in prayer? Yeah. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that we can come to you, that we have an open door, that we can come boldly because of what Jesus did. And we thank you for that privilege. We know that you're not worried that things are out of control. You're not wringing your hands. We know that you're sovereign, you're Lord, you're King of Kings, Lord of Lord. We believe you're the Lord of history and you will have your way. And we pray that for this time in which we live, that you would raise up your leaders and empower them with your spirit. God, I pray that there'd be a continuation of the, the numbers of people across the world in your church that believe in your power to heal today, to empower today, to release gifts today. We thank you that that which started just a little over a century ago has grown to a half a billion people. And we thank you for that. And we pray that it would continue. But we also pray that you would give us uh, the wisdom in which God, that we could build bridges to others who are not yet part of this movement. Uh, Lord, that they would, uh, recognize and, and realize that there really is more than what they've been taught of your power for today. And so we pray for a unity. We pray that we know, we know, we know that we're praying according to your will in this matter because we're praying Jesus' prayer. 
for unity that would be as one. And so in Jesus' name, we pray that you would use us to build bridges. And uh, Father, that there we would see more people empowered. We pray, Father, that your power would be on us because as some of my friends said, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to lose everything to see a visitation of God, but I'm not willing to lose everything to talk about a visitation of God. And so, Lord, we pray that you would back up the, the faith and the words with your spirit and that people would uh, realize that the, the kingdom is the pearl of great, great prize and they'd be willing to go and sell all that they could have, purchase it. In Jesus' name, we pray for a blessing on all the church and that uh, there would be a strengthening. And as the church is strengthened, it would have an impact on our cultures. In Jesus' name, for his glory. Amen. Kyle Searcy and Dan Hammer, just continue praying, please. So, Father, uh, Father, in the name of, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your guidance, your leadership. We thank you for your grace. We bring the body of Christ before you, God. We ask and pray that that which aligns perfectly with your heart, that which you know is needed for our day and time in this culture, that which God represents you in a better way, you begin to release, Lord. Help us to be corrected where we need to be corrected and help us to see clearly the structures, the systems that need to be set up to bring balance, Lord. We thank you for those who are calling upon you now, God, that you're hearing them they're struggling through the storm and the other things they're dealing with god continue to cover them and keep them brother kelly and others keep them by your grace lord let help come where help is needed we thank you for bishop matera and his insight and as he's guiding this group god continue to give him strength and courage and wisdom and insight in all the areas of his life keep his family and god we thank you for the future there's a great sense of optimism we hold that you're doing something you're molding and you're making things such a way god that you you're gonna you're gonna have greater impact through our lives and our ministries in days ahead we thank you and give you praise in jesus name amen Dan Hammer. father we thank you for your love lord we thank you for randy's impact in his ministry over the years we pray you bless he and his wife their ministry you'd anoint them and you'd raise up sons and daughters that would model having godliness not a form of godliness and denying the power but walking in godly character and having the power and demonstration of the spirit we ask that you would bring your kingdom in power you said the kingdom of heaven and kingdom of god is not in word but in power and father we thank you for the power that you're going to release thank you for the refining you're doing in all our hearts in all our lives in this season that we get back to your word we get back to your ways and father may we bring unity lord like uh, Papa Kelly said, and others, and Joseph, may we, we, may we have the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Uh, may we be an example by our lives, even more than our words. May we embody and incarnate your life and your love into people that they would want to see that, that, they, that we all need correction in our lives, that we all need discipline in our life. And Father, we thank you for what you're doing in the body of Christ to mature us, uh, to bring us to a oneness in you and a, and a fullness that you've desired Lord, that we might all grow up into one new man, into the fullness of Christ. And Father, we just thank you for these times that you can sharpen us, that you can strengthen us, that you can guide us, help us to work together to see your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name. Okay, Dr. Marilyn Weeks and G.D. Lavoie. Father God, we come to you giving you thanks and praise. We declare, God, that you are a good God. You are a mighty God. You are an awesome God. And we declare our love for you, Father God. Lord, in the midst of tragedy, in the midst of things that are going beyond what our wildest dreams, God, we still have to say thank you for being a good God.
So we release, oh God, our lives to you. We surrender all to you, particularly as the body of Christ. Forgive us, God, where we have failed you. Forgive us, God. Forgive us, God, where we have looked at one another, God, ignored one another, or just simply have not perceived one another, God. Oh God, your body, your body, your body. Father God, Lord, bring us together as one. Uh, let it be become a priority that is at the top, oh God. Lord, that is the basis for our ecclesiology, God. Yes. We are built upon one rock. <laughs> and Lord God, when we break that down, it's one rock. That rock is uncut. Oh, yes. My God, yes. it is an uncut rock. God, which means it must be supernaturally put together. It must be supernaturally welded together, oh God, by the power of your spirit, God. Intellect cannot do alone, God, but the power of your spirit. So Father God, we say right now, have your way, God. Have your way in the church of Jesus Christ. Have your way, Father God, as we yield. We thank you for the leaders, God, that are here. Yes. God, we thank you for the leaders that are also not here, God. There are leaders, God. There are leaders, God, that we cannot forget, God, that are a part of your company, a part of your body, God. So we begin, Lord, right now to call in uh, 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 the leaders of your body, Father God, that we be one. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Lord, we thank you for your church. Uh, this has been a wonderful, wonderful session. Uh, just learning and hearing about your faithfulness to your church over hundreds and hundreds of years. We thank you because regardless of what the church is going through, regardless of the crisis, regardless of even what the world thinks, your faithfulness to your church still stands. We thank you because you're still building your church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against your church. We thank you for leaders that you are raising, leaders with heart, leaders with purpose, leaders with understanding that you have placed over your church to lead, to guide, and to continue your work on earth. I thank you for Bishop Matera, uh, who is the leader of this group. Thank you for Dr. Randy, how you've used him greatly. Uh, thank you for everyone here uh, that you have called, anointed, ordained, and you continue to use uh, as instruments, as vessels, Lord, uh, to continue to advance your cause here on earth. Yes, we recognize there will always be imperfections. We recognize there will always be uh, errors. Even the scripture says, you know our frame. You remember that we are out of dust. So we believe that you're never shocked by our imperfections because you understand all this. But we honor you because we know you are still, you still love your church. You're still building your church. And so, Father, we release ourselves as pastors, as leaders, as apostles. The Lord, you will walk through us. Uh, you will do what you need to do in us and through us for your church to continue to be the light and the salt of the earth. For your church to continue to, you know, shine. And for your church to be what the scripture says uh, through the church, you know, the wisdom of God will be revealed to the principalities and powers. That through the church, you know, the world will be saved. Through the church, you know, there will be light and there will be, you know, the move of God and the world will be saved through the church. We thank you because we, you know, we know you've answered our prayer. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Uh, Vince Thomas. Well, amen. We have had such a powerful day again on the U.S. Cal Global Table. Uh, I do want to share a piece of housekeeping uh, information in that we uh, this week again had some trouble streaming to Facebook and YouTube. 
However, the meeting was recorded, and so it will be uploaded to our live streaming platforms and Facebook and YouTube um, by this evening, where you all can watch it, and it will also be uploaded to our website as well, and uh, our prayers that we're able to uh, be able to live stream directly to Facebook and YouTube uh, going forward. So that's kind of some things we've been working on behind the scenes. Uh, as we have discussed before, uh, please feel free to visit uscal.us where you're able to access even more resources and support what God is doing. Uh, and so uh, with that being said, that is all that I have today. And again, uh, back to uh, Bishop Matera. Well, we had another great time together. We love you all. Let's just take a moment to say goodbye to everybody. It's good to see Shannon, Steve, Steve's iPhone. I don't know who that is. It might be mm -hmm. Steve Fideski. I'm not sure. Uh, Rick Menard, uh, Regulus Energy. I think that's Canada. Of course, Randy Clark, Peter Carrion, Melvin, Lynn Kashaba. So good to see all of you. Uh, Brian Stock still, I think it is, James Lockett, Por Pestapora, Reg, all of you, David Van Fleet, all of you, thank you for being on. Love you, Bishop. Appreciate it. Thank you, Bishop. Awesome. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Randy. This is Gina thank here from uh, New Jersey. God bless you from the Bronx. <laughs> thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Thank you everyone. God bless, God bless you, everybody. everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you, guys. Bye, bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. Rick Menard, oh wow, good to see you. Melvin Green. Bye, -bye Bishop. Good to see you, Melvin, praise God. Bless you, Bishop, love you. Love you, man, good seeing you. Where are Thanks you so from? much, Joe. Uh, Time to pick up the shovel. Talk to you later. Oh man, I'll give you $10 if you come to my house. Hey, <laughs> give me 20, I'll bring my snowblower. <laughs> Cause you're gonna need it. <laughs> oh man. All right. Bless you guys. All right. Love yeah, you. I'm in Douglasville, Bishop. God bless. Where are you, Melvin? Uh, Douglasville, Georgia. There are Christians in Georgia? Yeah. Oh, yes, wow. it is. <laughs> oh, wow. That's that's amazing. I'm learning something new. Yeah. I thought I thought Vince Thomas was the only saved person. He in brought me in. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, He's doing right. great evangelism here in Georgia. <laughs> and then with George Runyon's from the godly state of California. <laughs> man, it, will be. it will be. That's right, <laughs> especially with your apostolic leadership, man. See y'all next Thursday. All right. Well, goodbye, everybody. I got to get to the shovel now, too. Bye. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye-bye.